Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today we have one of the best doubles players of all time on Daniel Nestor. Daniel, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, so Euros Budimac, who has been on the show before, connected us because um, you are launching a new uh, doubles course called Mastering Doubles with Daniel Nestor. Uh, start off we're going to dive into some of that i've had a chance to go through the course myself um but start off talking about how this course kind of came to be and then we'll kind of get into your career and then a little bit more about the course yeah i mean just thought it, it was a good idea uh given you know some things were transforming to, to online i heard that uh you know, people were doing a little bit of fitness online uh, during the pandemic and, and, you know, just starting to, to shift towards, uh, you know, that kind of mentality. And uh, I just thought, you know, it's things were quiet during COVID and, you know, Borosh is a good friend and he, uh, he has some good contacts. So he put together a venue for us in uh, beautiful British Columbia on the uh, Sunshine Coast and uh, I met him there and we spent a couple of days going through uh, some uh, doubles analysis and uh, videotaping. And yeah, it was pretty intense, but uh, I got some good stuff out of it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I've had a chance to go through it. And I love the format of it, how you go through serve, return, and then server's partner, returner's partner um, to break it down. And, and we're going to dive into that in a second. But I want to step back real quick and talk about um, your kind of story and your career. So for people who don't know, um, tell us just how you got started in tennis growing up to kind of where you are today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, so I was uh, born in the seventies, uh, 51 right now, just, uh, just turned 51. So, uh, I moved from Serbia to Canada in 1976. I was four, uh, only spoke Serbian and, uh, you know, didn't really maintain uh, that heritage that well. I, now I only speak English. I understand a little bit, but uh, you know, with all the Serbs uh, or with the Serb dominating tennis and, and other sports, uh, I wish I would have uh, maintained it a little bit. But uh, my wife is born mm -hmm. in Serbia. But anyway, uh, yeah. So tennis okay. was pretty popular back then in the in the seventies, and uh, I was a huge Jimmy Connors fan. And uh, I used to go to the schoolyard wall. I uh, was a member of the club. Uh, we lived right beside tennis courts, but it was basically just a summer club. And uh, so I'd go to the school and uh, where I went to school, public school, and uh, we just hit the wall for long periods at a time. Didn't have much to distract me like the kids nowadays. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, got pretty good uh, by doing that. And then, uh, you know, as I said, I was pretending I was Jimmy Connors playing at the US Open or Wimbledon or whatever it was. And, uh, and, and then uh, slowly started getting into some programs, coach said I had talent. So I was playing soccer and basketball all the time, but uh, probably wasn't fast enough for soccer or, 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 bas or basketball. And, uh, you know, he said that I had talent. So I kind of stuck with it, started playing tournaments and one thing led to another. Awesome. And then you, uh, Join the Pro Tour, you end up having this really successful uh, doubles career. Um, I want to talk about a couple of your partners here. So uh, you made Grand Slam finals and won Grand Slams with uh, Mark Knowles, uh, Nenad uh, Zimonic, and then Max Mirny. Talk about each of those partners and what, what made each of them a great doubles partner, and then how did you adjust to playing with each one of them? Well, if you know uh, tennis and, and no doubles, you'll know that they're, all three of them are really good at the net. And that was the philosophy, especially when I first started playing doubles. It was, uh, you know, a lot of net play. If you watch singles uh, back in the 80s, 90s, it was uh, a lot of certain volley tennis, uh, you know, all court tennis and a lot of finishing at the net and uh, and aggressive tennis, of course, fast where the balls were lighter. And so people's game styles were we're more in tune with, uh, with with net play and the transition from singles to doubles was an easy one. For me, I was always better at doubles just from a movement standpoint. Uh, I, and I didn't have to cover the whole court, which which helped me and I had good hands and uh, good serve and hit the ball pretty well. And uh, so so it made sense. And, uh, you know, I got lucky to play with Mark Knowles. Uh, he was already established. He had won the 
the well, it was called the Canadian Open back then. Now it's called the National Bank Open with uh, Jim Courier in the early '90s. And uh, uh, my dad entered me in a tournament in uh, Bogota, Colombia, which I didn't even know that he entered me. And Knowles came up to me during the US Open, which was a couple weeks before, and he asked me to play. And uh, and I told him, "Yeah, let's play." I didn't know what I was playing, but if I'm going, well, let's do it for sure. It was it, for me. It was a thrill to play with someone that was already established, and we ended up winning that tournament. And and luckily for me, uh, he wanted to continue. So we played uh, the following season together and we did well. We were very consistent. And, uh, you know, he was uh, obviously a very good athlete, a strong guy, very fast and, and unbelievable the net. He was he was one of the best net players at, at the time. And uh, his anticipation of the net was was amazing. Uh, he was good in singles too. And and just watching him like come to the net, he was very difficult to pass. And so I learned a lot from him. And... Uh, Am I going one partner after the other? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, we played for 10 years off and on and had a lot of success together. And then, uh, you know, just quite a long time, you know, how things are in relationships. And uh, I, I decided to start playing with Zimenech. And, you know, that was, that worked out pretty well. Although initially, you know, kind of struggled at first, but then uh, again, you know, big server, great at the net uh, and, you know, very good one hand back end, just like Knowles. And, and, uh, you know, we, we won Wimbledon our first year playing together and, and, uh, you know, we had three very solid years. We won three grand slams and, and, uh, you know, we, I'm not going to say we, we always saw eye to eye, which we didn't. And, you know, same yeah. with Knowles, and then, but, uh, you know, maybe it was a little more, intense with uh, Zimenech as far as uh, not seeing eye to eye and uh, so we split we got back together and for one year also had a good year we didn't win any grand slams but we won a couple of masters uh, in 2014 but in between that I played with Max Mirny who uh, obviously was a great singles player top 20 singles player was you know tremendous serving volleyer very good athlete uh, and uh, another guy that was uh, very difficult to pass uh in uh, in singles, especially in, in on doubles, it's hard to pass anyone because there's isn't that much space. But uh, in singles, he would uh, he would park himself on the net. He was a big guy, and uh, he was difficult to pass. That's why he had so many big wins. Not to mention he had a huge serve and very smart player. And uh, so you know, we won the French Open two years in a row and and uh, played very well together. Had a great time and. And, uh, you know, my mistake there, uh, deciding, you know, he kind of made mention that he was slowing down a little bit as far as schedule. And he won the, the Olympics with, uh, as the rank in 2012. So I figured, you know, he's, he might be, you know, getting close to the end. He, he already had four kids at the time. And, uh, you know, so I made the mistake of, of switching. Uh, he wanted to play a smaller schedule and, you know, I thought, uh, I needed to play, you know, as much as possible, which was probably a mistake considering what was called already 40 <laughs> and uh, so we split and then you know the next four or five years I had uh, some good results with uh, Eddie Vaseline uh, as I said Ziminish before Robert Lentz said a little bit uh, Leander Pays and uh, you know but it was mostly switching partners for the last few years of my career mm -hmm. yeah you said you played uh, 10 years with with um, Knowles that's something we really don't see a lot of anymore, right? On on the pro tour, I mean, it seems like at most you'll get maybe three or four years um, with with most teams, anyways. Uh, what do you kind of attribute that to? Um, you talked about how uh, you and Knowles didn't always see eye to eye, and maybe it was a little more intense with other partners. Um, but but what do you kind of make of uh, that on the pro tour now? Well, I think it's, you know, there's sometimes human nature to think, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. And, and mm -hmm. you know, if, if you go through a, a stale period, a lull in, in your results and, and, you know, you're not used to that. You know, with Knowles, we were very consistent for many years. Uh, I, I don't think we played our best in Grand Slams. We did win three, but we won a lot of Masters. I actually, uh, I named uh, uh, the Mastering Doubles was, uh, was to do with that because I won... Uh, my record of masters was, was quite a bit better than grand slams uh you know i was better in grand slams as i got older but uh you know it's it, it seemed to do much better in the masters and and uh yeah so Knowles and i uh you know we we had very good runs uh but you know there were some periods there where we 
you know, we weren't doing that well and, and, you know, probably got to us and, and myself and, and just thought, you know, there's better opportunity and, and often that's a mistake. I mean, it worked out with Zimnich. Uh, it didn't work out with, uh, you know, Zimnich was the one who stopped our partnership uh, after three pretty good years. And then, you know, I don't think he had the same success with anyone else. And so in, in that regard, uh, it's probably a mistake by him, but, uh, you know, I did the same thing with Mirny, right? So, I mean, no one's perfect mm -hmm. and everyone has regrets, but I think it's it's unfortunate. I I, I would want people to learn from my mistakes. Uh, I, I go through that in the video a little bit uh, that, you know, if you have something special with someone, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you're winning for a reason. You have amazing results for a reason. You play well just because, you know, things don't go well for a while, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not something to, to panic about. I mean, if it's a year, maybe yeah, a full year, but a few months here and there, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's normal. I mean, you look at uh, any sport, you'll have uh, top teams or it's not, not pure domination. They, they sometimes they play well in the playoffs or they always play well, play well in the playoffs and, and, you know, just getting the playoffs is enough. And, Mm -hmm. So I think uh, just for for us and for other, you know, what I, this is this is the, applies to every level. I mean, people, you know, find someone that that you're successful that you feel good with. I mean, that's it's something that you know kind of right away. You have like a chemistry. You move well together. You understand each other's game styles. You understand how to play. You 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 kind of have uh, the same mentality of, as to how you want to win. And and once you get that with someone and and things feel like they're flowing and and it's it's something that's that you should treasure and, and definitely you know keep in consideration when uh when making those big decisions for sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah I'm, I'm chatting uh tomorrow with Rajiv Ram actually and he you know he and Joe Salisbury are one of the teams who have been together a while right and the beginning of this year they didn't do quite as well um so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him about that as well it's a very fascinating topic for me um so I want to ask a couple other questions and then let's dive into some of the, the topics in the course. Uh, so I saw, I was looking at your results in the grand slams and then masters. Um, and you were two and one against the Brian brothers in the grand slams. I didn't finish counting in the masters. It looked like you might have had a winning record against them. Do you know what your record was? I don't know. I just know that uh, they're up 30, 29 in total. So, uh, uh, okay. yeah, possible <laughs> at the, but I think it was the 2013 U S open and uh, uh -huh. we lost a three setter against the Bryans on center court. It was amazing. Uh, we were playing great and I kind of wilted in the heat in the third set. We had some chances in the second and, uh, and after the match, uh, I got called to do some press, and the guy came up to me and uh, he said, "You realize that was the fifty third time you played the Bryans? I had no idea." And he said, "Now it's after today, it's twenty seven, twenty six for that." I'm like, "Oh my god, oh, what wow. a way to 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 <laughs> go down by one!" But uh, yeah, we, we ended thirty twenty nine. Okay, so you're practically dead even with them. Um, wh yeah. What made them so good? What made them so tough to play against? I mean, everything. They're, they're so good at everything. I mean, uh, you know, they serve so well. They put so much pressure on you with their serve, and they put a lot of balls in play on returns. They hit the ball great from the back. I mean, they're, they're today's doubles. I mean, I would say the Woodies were dominating in the 90s because they were so, like, crafty and, and you know, understanding of, of the volleys and the angles and, and the spins and the, the feel and, and you know, hitting the hitting your spots and and you know the guy, as I said the game kind of transformed early two thousands early millennium to you know more of a power game and and more of a athletic game and, and they're the the typical uh, you know new millennium team of of big hitting you know putting a lot of balls in play as I said big forehands and uh, and you know all over the net athletic at the net great smashes but ability to finish and. And uh, so, you know, they kind of took over and, and I mean, they didn't just take over. They, they ran with it for, for so long. And so it was, uh, I mean, they were great for doubles. I mean, it, it was mm -hmm. amazing just being part of tennis while they were there and, and they did so much for doubles. And, and uh, so we're all appreciative of them. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so you're left-handed. 
what advice would you have for a right-handed player who's playing with a lefty for the first time? Um, I mean, it's all about game styles, I would say. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it depends on, you know, whether you want forehands and mental forehands on the outside. Uh, maybe that uh, lefties are a little erratic mentally sometimes. <laughs> you got to be, <laughs> be a little more patient because they tend to be creative, but uh, inconsistent. So, you know, they, they might not be always, I, I, I always sense that the, the, the righties were, you know, more solid individuals, more consistent, more, uh, you know, less temperamental and, and uh, you know, kept their emotions in check a little better. And then the, and then the lefties were, you know, when they're hot, they're, they're unstoppable type thing. But uh, hmm. I mean, it, it really depends on game style. I mean, the, obviously the serves coming in a different way. If you're playing with a righty, uh, uh, if the righty's playing with a lefty for the first time and, and you're, you know, just understanding the spin, how it's going to, you know, jam the the player on the, on the ad side, a righty on the ad side more so than on, on the, on the deuce side. So it might be tougher for the, for the, the returner on the ad side to take that ball cross court that they have a tendency to pull that up the line. So, you know, just by moving, you know, you, you might be more aggressive on the deuce side and, and more ready on the ad side for balls coming near you. And, and, you know, little things like that. It's just a different spin, but uh, it, it basically mm-hmm. comes down to game styles and, and, and all that and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah. Um, any advice for uh, lefties? who typically play with, with a right-handed player? Are there any like common mistakes you see, especially at the club level? Not so much with that. I mean, I, I go, I go through it more in the video, just with so many typical things that you see at the club level of just the way that, you know, players start the point they they seem to be so overprotective of the alleys, mm-hmm. the way they move once the point starts, you know, they're not moving forward. They're kind of moving sideways first and, you know, they're taking themselves out of the play through that. They're turning their shoulder rather than keeping their shoulders square. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're probably not, uh, you know, hitting enough balls down the line during, uh, during a baseline rally, but, you know, most club players are serving and staying back and engaging that rally. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, once in a while return or, uh, or baseline shot down the line, just, you know, just to keep an opponent honest because, you know, Eventually, the the player, you know, it doesn't matter the age, they're, they're going to start leaning in the middle, and and uh, so it's just little things, and and uh, you yeah. know, understanding the the lob. I mean, at the club level, the lob is so important because you know people aren't moving as well, and it's you know they tend to park themselves, on, you know, too close to the net sometimes. So so it's uh, those little things, but uh, you know, as far as righty lefty, I don't think it's. Uh, it's that big of a difference uh, or, you know, especially at the club level, I don't think, uh, you know, the, yeah. the spins are as, as prominent as, you know, a lefty on tour, you know, would probably use the spins to his advantage more than a, a club player. I would say. Right. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, so, so let's dive into some of these uh, questions. I, I've gone through the uh, modules on the serve return servers, partner returners, partner, and I've got, um, we're going to kind of give the listeners a little preview um, and obviously yeah. we'll send them uh, to the website to, to learn more and enroll if they'd like to. So starting off with a serve, uh, you talked a little bit about the serve and volley. Uh, what are some of the common half volley mistakes that people make? Because this is, this is an area I was actually teaching a, a clinic um, last Friday and a few of the ladies there were saying, I like to be at the net, but I don't know how to serve in volley. Um, what are yeah. some common mistakes you see with that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's no point in forcing something, especially when you get a little bit older. But if you want to be at the net, there's nothing wrong with serving, you know, staying back and, and hitting the next one and coming in when you're a little mm-hmm. more balanced. You know, I mean, it, you know, serving volleying is something that, uh, you know, to, to master you're doing for years and it, you know, it affects your serve too. Generally serving volleyers are people who toss the ball a little further in front when they're serving, you know, trying to build that momentum to get to the net. So if you're not comfortable doing that, that's fine. You, you just, as a, as a baseline player, you're, you know, kind of being a little more forceful with your baseline shot to try and create the opportunity to come to the net. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think, like you said, with the with the half volley, I mean, the, the biggest common mistake you see is, you know, people are reaching way too far in front to to try and, you know, they don't want the ball to bounce. They don't want to hit a half volley. 
So they're, they're reaching way too far in front to get it like out of the air one, or even, mm -hmm. you know, when it does bounce, I mean, I think I say it in the video, like it doesn't matter what stroke you're hitting, serve, return, volley, baseline shot. It, it's got to be in your sweet spot. Right. And it's the same thing mm -hmm. with a half volley. So you have to let it come to you. What, I mean, obviously if, if you're able to get the ball in the air, you know, let's say the ball's floating or, or you know, it's, it's advisable to move forward, but once it's below the level of the net, you know, there, there's no point charging anymore and, and trying to get that ball that early. You're much better just, you know, staying balanced and letting the ball come to your, to your sweet spot, you know, letting the mm -hmm. ball drop and, and then just, and another thing is with the half volley is the preparation, right? I mean, you see a lot of ladies preparing, you know, with a loop like they do from the baseline, you know, which, which is, you know, mm -hmm. volleying is like catching. It's, you know, you often see like a, a, a good coach would take, a beginner uh, player volley or, or someone that's, you know, just doesn't understand volleying and they make them catch the ball, right? Because when you're catching, you're waiting with your hands still for the ball to come to you. You're not, you wouldn't swipe it at a ball if you were catching, right? Your hand mm -hmm. would be still waiting for it in front of you. And that's what volleying is. And it's the same thing with a half volley. You're waiting for the ball to come to you with very minimal backswing. You're keeping the racket up with the, uh, with a with a firm wrist you don't you don't want a broken wrist because you know then you're going to hit a flimsy ball so you're, you're get, we often use the analogy of a cup you're holding a coffee cup on the end of the racket if you let it break you let it drop then uh then it's spilling right and you let the the racket head drop when you're hitting a top spin from the baseline but you don't do that at the net so definitely letting the ball come into your power zone and and preparing at the height of the ball so i use the, the clock analogy in the video you know, whether I'm on the court and I say, if the ball's coming at seven o'clock or five, whatever it is, I don't know, ready, lefty, five o'clock, seven o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, four o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever it is, uh, three and nine, uh, you're preparing at the height of the ball. You're not preparing, you know, doing a loop or, or starting with your racket up and then going down. You just put, you're standing with the racket in front and then you just put your hand down and wait for the ball. That's the most simple. And, and that's what you would do if you were catching, right? If, I'm going to show you like my hands here. If, if someone throws you a low ball, you wouldn't do this, the catch. You would just put your hand right. down, right? It's the same yeah. thing with a volley. So yeah, that's a good analogy. I like that. It's simple things like that, that, uh, that people just, I mean, it's a, again, it's a repetition sport. So, you know, if you start from a young age, it definitely helps. And, and those things, sure. you know, become, become, you know, second nature, but for the people that are, picking it up when you, when you give analogies like catching or a clock or whatever, then it, I think it helps a lot and it simplifies things. Right. And yeah. then, you know, I use the example of uh, Vashik Pospisil. I mean, he's a, he's a good volleyer and he's, he's very good at letting the, like the best, the best volleyers are the ones that let it come into the power zone. It looks like they're not doing anything, you know, because mm -hmm. they're hitting the ball in their sweet spot all the time. It doesn't look mm -hmm. like they're trying. It's, it's the same as, is someone from the baseline that's uh that's that looks like they're not trying but they're hitting the ball so hard right yeah it's letting the ball come into your power zone and that applies to to almost every stroke yeah that makes perfect sense i'm uh gonna make some adjustments on my backhand half volley after hearing that uh, i feel like i've been reaching too far out in front on some of those well, you can take the racket, out of the air you take the, yeah you take the racket back but you can't let the racket head drop well, yeah. When you, when you take, I, I have this problem with my kids a lot. They, as soon as they take the racket back, they break their wrist. You know, mm -hmm. you can take the racket back with it up still, and then volley. Well, taking it back is fine, but taking it back controlled is when your racket head is still up, right? Like, right. You, like I said, you're holding the coffee cup up, and it's the same. Even when it's low, it's still not. Your wrist isn't broken, so it, it's hard to understand that you're holding it up when when your racket head is low, waiting for the ball, but it's still like firm in your hand. I'm not saying mm -hmm. you're squeezing hard. I'm saying your wrist is, is almost locked, right? It's not a flimsy wrist. Yeah. Yeah. But that makes yeah, sense. It's, it's things like that. So another thing you talked about is, is prioritizing placement on the serve. So, you know, let's say there's uh, a player who comes to you and says, I have a really good power serve, a really good flat serve. I like to hit it really hard, but I can also place it in the box. Why is it better? to choose placement over power. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's you know, harder return a serve that's, that's far away from you. I mean, if I'm playing a huge server and I know that if I just take a step back and the ball's coming into my area all the time, then it's not a big deal, right? I mean, it, I mean, okay, I, I've played tennis my whole life, but it, I think it applies to, 
to, to, to everyone. I mean, if they're not making you stretch and, and let's say you're getting overpowered, you take a step back and now you have more time, it's going to feel okay rather than the guy who's, you know, pulling you off the courts and, and, you know, making you stretch, you know, making you off balance, you know, that those serves are putting you off balance. And, and so it's so advisable. Like, and, and if I'm, if I'm coaching a kid to, to be a good server or adult, whatever, someone that's serious about tennis, I'm putting targets on the, on the court, you know, that yeah. that's how you, that, that's how you groove a serve and, and, you know, obviously you have to understand the spins and the pronation and, and all that that comes with the, with serving and, and, the, and like I said, the di different speeds and spins, but you are to pick the spot and those spots are generally shorter in the box. Like you want to get like the spots and you want to get comfortable hitting the spots. You, you got to put that target a little bit shorter in the box and that's forcing you to go up with your serve, go up with your legs and to, uh, to really work going up, you know, chest up, head up, and then shoulder through it, and then the, the snap of the wrist to create that, you know, side spin, top spin that, that'll give you the, you know, you're serving wide over the over the high, highest part of the net. You need to be going up and, and creating some arc on the serve to hit that spot, right? If you don't, if you just hit it straight, it's not going to pull your opponent off the court, right? It's just going to, it's going to be an easy, easy return. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one thing I see that's really common at the club level as well is, a lot of this happens more for guys who want to hit their serve really hard. They'll, yeah. they'll hit it really hard. Maybe they'll get some free points every now and then, but yeah. their first serve percentage will be so low that they're giving yeah. the opponent so many second serve looks that it's just not even an advantage. So well, I mean, that, that, can... that applies, especially for doubles too, right? Because I mean, mm -hmm. so much of the time, if you're playing at a, a, at a high level or a pretty good level, you can be a high club level. You want to set up your partner at the net. So you're not doing that when you're hitting a lot of second serve, even if right. it means you know, just, uh, taking a little bit off your first serve and, and, you know, putting a little more spin on it. And, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, to redirect the serve away from the net player, right? Especially if the net player knows how to move at the net. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting a really low percentage and you're just trying to hit a couple of aces, I mean, that, that would apply to singles more because, you know, <laughs> singles generally, you know, unless you're hitting an ace or, or a solid serve, you know, you're, you're, you got to rally, you got to play the point out. I mean, doubles, if you don't hit a great return, the guy's going to put it away at the net, right? You can get away with it if you're fast in singles, by you know, just getting it back, you know? Yeah. So yeah, you want to, you want to, you want a high percentage and, and you want to be serving away from your, uh, away from your opponent because you know if you're not hitting your spot and you're not serving hard, you know you're gonna you're gonna you're you're exposing your net your partner to get some hard balls hit at him or her, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's very key to. I mean, I say that in in the serving part of the video that the first most important thing as a server is the quality of your serve, right? Because I mean, you don't want to be worried about you know, how fast you're getting into the net, your first volley, your first baseline shot, you want to be hitting a quality serve because then you're going to get a weaker return. Right? Mm -hmm. And then it's easier to, to volley. It's easier to hit your baseline shot. So the quality yeah. of the serve is the most important thing. And I, so, I mean, I'm talking from experience because, you know, I'm, I'm a certain volleyer. I would, you know, start worrying about getting in too fast. My opponent's hitting returns to my feet and, you know, I'm trying to get in faster and faster, you know, and closer than as, as soon as possible. And then it's taking away from my serve. And if I hit a better serve, my opponent wouldn't be hitting balls at my feet. Right? Yeah. A lot of time you don't have to worry about that volley because it may not come back anyways. So, yeah. That's right. um, so uh, more often at the club level, we see serve and stay back. Uh, what should club players focus on for their, their serve plus one shot. Let's say they hit a serve, it comes back, it doesn't get to their net player, but it, it comes back to them at the baseline. Um, yeah. One thing you mentioned was don't redirect too soon. What else should we yeah. focus on well, for that yeah, serve, it's, it's serve plus one? Discipline. I mean, you're you're serving and you're you're going into the point prepared to hit, you know, as many shots as it takes, right? And and everyone knows whether it's serve or return. Generally, after you serve. You're a little bit off balance. It's it's not like you you're you know same thing with the return. You're a little bit off balance after after you land. So if the ball's coming deeper than you expected or wider than you expected, you're trying to get in the points called a neutralizing shot. So you're you know it's it's hard to attack those balls. You know if they're coming a little bit you know better than you thought or, or you know deeper than you thought or wider than you thought. So you're trying to like you know just get over there and hit a solid shot and then you're in the rally and then 
you, you know, you're, I bet you, you realize that your opponent is the same thing. Like he's just hit a return. He's probably a little bit off balance. So it's, it's just working your way into the point rather than trying, you know, you're a little bit off balance and you try a crazy shot down the line or force something that's not there. I mean, it's, it's just like any baseline rally, you know, if you're going cross court with someone and, and, you know, the, the, the drill is changing direction and you're changing direction at an inopportune time when, when your opponents hit a default, it's, it's going to be difficult to, to do that well, right? You're, you're changing direction generally, unless you're Djokovic or top player in the world, you're changing direction when you have a chance, right? When you have time. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with the, the philosophy, you know, after the serve, you, you're serving, staying back, you're waiting for your chance to attack or to hit it the net player or to, to hit a forceful shot. It's just a matter of recognizing what's happening in front of you and when that opportunity arises. You're not trying to force something because if you right. say to yourself, right, I have to get to the net on this point. Great. That's, that's a great uh, philosophy or strategy, but you have to <laughs> choose the right time to do it. Otherwise you're going to get yourself in trouble if you just hit a, Get a shot that's that's not quality in charge, and and then you know you're it's right to your opponent, and and you know they can dip it at your feet, they can hit an angle, they can blast it at you, hit a lob, whatever. It's mm -hmm. a, it's just recognizing yeah. when when that opportunity comes. It sounds like a lot of it has to do with just recognizing when you're on offense versus defense, yeah, versus I sure. guess neutral, right? Yeah. Um, and what you're doing with that shot too? I mean, you know, you're. If you have a high ball, you have a, a weak ball, then yeah, you can pump it at the at the net player. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a if your partner's at the net and, and you have an opportunity, let's say there's two at the at the net on the other side, and, and you know you have an opportunity to dip the ball in the middle and set up your partner, you, you're doing that too. If you have an opportunity to hit an angle, it depends on the ball too. But mm -hmm. but generally, if it's a, if it's a solid ball coming at you, you're trying to stay in the point with a solid ball back. You're not trying to to over overdo it. Yeah. Again, if you're, if you're very confident, you know, you've won a lot, you're feeling great. I mean, those shots are, you know, that it's easier to hit those shots, but if you're, I mean, how often does that happen? Right. You, that's, yeah. that's not, everyone loves to be in, in those situations when they're feeling great. And when they do happen, you're thinking, well, how do, how is it ever not like this? But that, yeah. that's like 5% of the time, 2% yeah. of the time, the rest of the time you're trying to figure out how to beat your opponent by hitting the, the right shot at the right time, you know, try to, figure out uh, the way to, to, to implement your game style, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to return. Um, first question, when should we return down the line? Well, again, this is, uh, there's, there's different philosophies here. I mean, early in match, is always a good idea, you know, especially mm -hmm. if you, you know, knowing your opponents, let's say your opponent, you know, your opponent likes to be aggressive at the net. Definitely early in a match, you're you're showing him that you're willing to do it, even if you miss the shot, right? Because mm -hmm. they know that you're you're going to try that shot, and that might be in their head as to you know how aggressive they might be after that, right? So you know it's it's advisable to to do it early. It's advisable to do it when you have time, right? And again, it comes again back to forcing something that's not there. If someone's hitting a great serve and and you're off balance and you're trying to to hit down the line, then you know. Hit, hit a shot that's that's difficult redirect when it's not there then it's not advisable right but again there's a couple of different philosophies but uh, definitely it's always a good idea when you have time you know just, just to challenge your opponent at the net you know hit a hard ball and see how they react to that it's it's good to do it early in a match and uh, it's it's just good for your opponent to know that you're willing to do it because and it's it's easy to play against someone that that always has the same pattern, right? They always like whether they might be always going down the line too, and maybe, maybe they overdo that. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's it's easy when when someone you know kind of knows what's coming before it's come. So you have to you know try and be a little bit unpredict unpredictable when the opportunity arises. How should we think about returning against a player who serves in volleys versus returning against a player who serves and stays back? Well, yeah, that's the, that's the, the difference between singles and doubles. I mean, generally the doubles players are are taking the returns a little bit earlier and they're trying to to get it as low as possible. So they're trying to hit it a little bit lower over the net. One, if, if you know, if you hit it lower over the net, I, I, Again, this is a similar philosophy to the to the serve. You're trying to make good contact. So it's, it's you know, if you make good contact and your opponent crosses, it's gonna be hard for him to put the ball away. Right. It's mm -hmm. it's you by you making good contact, you're 
you're allowing yourself worst case scenario to, I mean, obviously your opponent can hit a great shot or, or you can hit it well and it could be just a little bit high and, and your opponent can finish the volley. But generally, if you're hitting a ball well, worst case scenario is you're, you're in the point and you have another another chance. You, you hit it well, you can make your opponent miss too, right? So mm -hmm. generally, doubles players are returning a little bit earlier and a little bit lower with the net as opposed to singles players who are trying to hit it back deep, right? They're trying to hit the, the ball as deep as possible off a of first serve return. You know, they're, they're not trying to, to hit in the corners. You know, maybe a doubles player is trying to hit, obviously, away from the net player. They want to go down the line. It's a little bit more in the corners. But a singles player is generally trying to hit the ball deep so they can get in the point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that low ball is just so tough to poach on. And I, I think against yeah. the serve volley player, um, yeah. if it doesn't get to the server's partner, right, the server has to kind of pick it up from their feet, which is ideal yeah. for the and, turn and, team. And the proper movement by the net player who's the, the returner's partner by not looking back to see, <laughs> you never want to look back to see what your partner's doing. He should see, you know, one, that the, the return is hit well. And so he'll see by the, the opposing net player that's diagonal from him, unless they're playing eye. But uh, the general the typical doubles formation, he'll see just by his reaction, kind of what kind of returns coming. I mean, if he's, if he sees that, that the balls, that he's not going to make an aggressive move or, you know, then the ball's gotten by him and, and it's coming fast and, or that the, the, the server's coming in with a certain ball and he's hitting the ball low, then the, the return his partner is going to start putting some pressure on that. If he's doing the right job, he's going to move forward and put some pressure on the, on the server's first volley. Right. So there's, mm -hmm. there's no need that we go through this. I mean, there's no need to look back. I mean, if, if you're playing singles, you can call your own box. You can call your own box and doubles too. There's no, there's no need for uh, a partner to be calling your, your, your box when you're returning, right? Because then you're turning mm -hmm. your head and, and something can happen in, in a nanosecond in front of you that you miss by turning your head, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to the service partner. So one... Um, one thing you said in, in this module that I really liked a lot was uh, the mentality of wanting the ball is going to put you in position to get more balls. Talk yeah. a little bit more about the mentality. Uh, looks like you got a friend there. Um, oh, sorry. You're fine. Sorry. Um, yeah, so definitely it's, it's just the mentality, like a, a winning mentality of wanting the ball. I mean, you... you you're playing doubles. I mean, it, it's obviously not ideal that both guys or, or girls are going for the ball at the same time, but it's less ideal if, if the ball just goes to the middle with no one going for it. Right. So ideally you want the ball. I mean, you, you're, you know, you don't want to be over aggressive and cover 75% of the core. You're, you have to be ready for your 50%. So you, by doing that and, and by being aggressive in your 50%, you're going to get a lot of balls coming to you. And if you want the ball, generally you're going to move better. It's, it's the same mentality as in singles, baseline rally, whatever. If you want to hit a good shot, double, it doesn't matter. I shouldn't have said singles. It could have been double suit. If you want to hit a good shot and you're, you have an aggressive mentality, you're going to move better to the ball because you know that you have to be in position to hit a good shot. You know, if you're, if you're apprehensive and, and, you know, defensive minded, you know, you don't always have to be, you know, in a, in a great position to, to just play safe, high over the net and, and a deep ball and, or a slice or whatever. But if you want to hit to smack a ball we were watching that uh, big point in the second set, Djokovic and Medvedev in, in uh, the tiebreaker. I mean, Djokovic looked like he was, you know, struggling a little bit physically. And then he, he played this, I think it was four or five in the, in the breaker. And he, he stepped in a couple backhands and he wanted, like, he, he was going after it. He made the commitment to go after these shots. And you saw his movement and he went up to the ball and he smacked it. And, and he did that like two or three times in a row. And he, he got a defensive response out of Medvedev and it's the same mentality at, at the net I mean you, you're going to, you're moving to your spot and you want the ball and you're gonna you're gonna go after balls that uh, that are you know in your area and you're gonna you're gonna cover your area much better rather than you know is that my ball or you know maybe I, I hope my partner gets it or you know that that's kind of a over defensive mentality and and, and not something that you want to you definitely don't want to everyone's been there you know you like you you have a big point and and you're playing two back let's say you're, you're two at the baseline and and you know the ball just goes in between like you, you neither neither you or your partner takes it right and mm -hmm. it's it's better that you both are taking it. someone's call i mean the, the most ideal thing is someone's calling mine because that's a that's again a confident uh you know call and and you're going for it and once you see your 
partner doing that, you're going to back off because you see he's made an aggressive move to the ball. And the same thing, vice versa. If you've done that, your partner is going to see that you're you're going for it. And that's the same mentality at the net. You want the ball, you're going to cover more space and you're going to hit better balls. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. this is, I'm, I'm saying all oh, this is ideal, right? I mean, it's, it's not always easy to to have this mentality. This is the, I, I go through this in the, in the video. You want a robotic type approach to, to your mental side of your game. I mean, you, you don't want, you want to take emotions out of it. You want to, you want to just, you know, focus on, on what you have to do to play as, as well as you can. And, and, in the process, staying in the process, and 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 th these are things you can control, right? You can control how your mindset is going to be every point, and how you know you, you how your footwork is going to be, and, and and that kind of stuff, right? And and mm -hmm. so it's a lot of it's recognition, and but yeah, this is the most ideal scenario, and and I mean it's not always easy to achieve, and sometimes your opponents are going to hit great shots, but uh, and that's when you applaud them. But if you're doing the right things and wanting the ball, you're going to co definitely cover more space. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mentality. I, I feel like that. Um, yeah. Like you said, it's not always possible to achieve, but it's at least gives people something to strive for um, and yeah. constantly kind of remind themselves. I mean, I, I do feel like uh, and I get like this all the time, too, but I, I feel like a lot of club players, when they are the server's partner, they're thinking, OK, I'm going to react if they hit it to me versus yeah. I'm going to go get this ball. And obviously, if it's out of reach, it gets by you, your partner, the server has their ground stroke or, or half volley or whatever. And then you can have the same mentality on the next one. I'm going to go get this ball. Okay, that one didn't come to me. I'm going to go get this next one. You know, And if you can kind of train yourself to continue that, I, I feel like it'll make you a better net player like you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, you don't want to overdo it too. I mean, you, you don't want that uh, mentality of like, you know, starting to go take your partner shots away from them, you know, that like you, you want to be, it's, it's like a controlled aggression mindset. You know, you're, you're very capable of, of covering your area, you know, and, and, you know, maybe the 60% of the court, but once you start like venturing over to your partner's side and, and kamikaze and taking balls that you shouldn't yeah. be, then, then you've lost the teamwork aspect. Right. But I, again, like it's a lot of it is recognition and a lot of it is like, for me, I, I discussed this in, in one of the chapters is, is keeping a journal and this helped me a lot. And this is one of the things that, as I said, also in, in one of the chapters of working with sports psychologists and, and this really helped me because there are moments in a match where you don't achieve something or you, you, you have a regret and then you go later and, you, you know, these things are lingering after a match. If, if you take tennis seriously at whatever level and um, you lose an important match or something happens in a match that, that uh, you know, you kind of wish you had back, then it's very important to, to write that stuff down and, and to, because then you'll remember it and you go over this the next time you play a match uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can think about it all night long and then your, your next match is in 10 days and you might have forgotten about it, right? So the more you write this stuff down, the more you're going to, remember and recognize when this kind of situation arises again so mm -hmm. that stuff is to me is is very important i mean i think that's important in all aspects of life to <laughs> write yeah. a lot of things down and, and you know you're going to remember obviously a lot better than that. sure so uh one of the common mistakes you talked about earlier was uh, at the club level players covering the alley too much why should we be okay with get getting beat down the alley well, because it, I don't think it happens that often, right? I mean, I, the worst thing mm -hmm. to me is, you know, you're just static at the net. You're, you're too close to the alley and, and your opponent and your partner or whatever, I don't know what, what your uh, opponent on uh, diagonal to you at the net is doing, but if you're just making life easy for your opponent who's at the baseline hitting cross-court shots, then you're not doing your job because one, I mean, it, it would be much more difficult to hit a cross-court shot from the baseline, if they if your opponent sees you moving at the net or sees you in the right position, because then you're you're kind of like or closer to the middle, because then you're kind of taking away for the, the the that relaxed feeling of hitting an easy cross court shot, right? Because you know you feel pressure, you feel like you have to hit a better cross court shot. So, mm -hmm. Def, I mean, again, this is it's easy to say this for you know mobile people, people that are you know very active and very very fit and all that, but you know again. It could be at any any level, you know, if you're able to play doubles, you know, however old you are, if you're moving forward while you're 
while your uh, opponent's about to hit, then you're you're cutting off angles just by moving forward, even if it's one step. And and not only that, if the ball comes to you, you have that momentum to hit a better volley. If you're static, and and you're not covering, you're not cutting off any angles because you're not going forward, and you're and you're and you're not probably going to hit as good of a volley if if you don't have any momentum behind your volley if the ball does come to you, right? So there's different. Uh, reasons as to why you want to be a little bit closer to the middle when when your partner's returning sorry when your opponent's returning or your, your opponent's engaging in that crossbar rally just one because you're putting pressure on them and two because you know when you do make that forward move and the ball is in your area you're going to hit you're going to be closer to the net one and it's going to be easier to put the ball away or hit a better volley and uh and it just it's just better for your volley if you have that momentum while you're hitting mm -hmm. a volley because a lot of them People don't understand uh, uh, at different levels that the, the power on the volleys comes from the legs. It does not come from the swing. The swing, I mm -hmm. mean, there's there's obviously power on the on the swing from the baseline shots, but there's also legs. But more so on the on the volleys, the legs are, are where you get your power and the finish. I mean, you see a lot of a lot of stopping at the ball. You see a lot of big backswing stop at the ball. That's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want to start at the ball and finish, right? This, mm -hmm. That applies to the baseline. That baseline yeah you're taking a bigger swing but you want the the during and the after to be uh, very good as opposed to having a, a wild big huge backswing right i mean if you're a great player and you have uh, unbelievable timing and you take a big backswing and, and finish big that's great for you but that's not always easy to time balls that way it's you see that look at Djokovic's preparation it's so compact and he's mm -hmm. finishing unbelievable he's using his body and he's finishing and um, this all the pros basically you rarely see a pro unless they're nervous you know kind of guiding balls stopping the balls and you know that's where you lose control i mean it's uh, the old i use this a lot I, I say safety from spin right the more you, you know when nadal you know sometimes i would imagine i don't know if he gets nervous because he's so good but uh you know you see sometimes his balls landing a little bit shorter that's safe for him but he's putting tremendous uh, revolutions on the ball same with jack sock they, they put so much spin on the ball that's their safety right Mm -hmm. yeah. you're not going to get safety by stopping at the ball and trying to guide the ball deep because when once you get a little bit nervous those balls are going to start sailing on you you get you get safety from spin it's the same thing with a second serve you get safety from or, or first serve you get safety from put, putting more spin on it not from trying to push it in and, yeah. and you see like you know at the often sign of, of choking is trying to just push the ball in yeah yeah you have to kind of accelerate through it yeah the acceleration um, is safety so I've got a lot more questions here, but I want to be respectful of your time and people, people can go and uh, enroll in the course to, to learn more, but I want to ask this last one and then we'll get into some rapid fire and I'll let you go. Um, yeah. So another quote that you said in one of the modules, and I really liked this a lot. You said, I try to encourage people to recognize when things aren't going well. So that really resonated with me because I see so many club level players just almost like banging their heads against the wall, just using the same tactic or the same strategy yeah. over and over and never making adjustments. Talk yeah. a little bit more about that mindset and being able to recognize when things aren't going your way. Well, again, that comes from writing things down. So you should, uh, however many years or hours or whatever, however much time you dedicate to tennis, you should be able to know what you do well and what you don't do well. So or when you behave bad or don't react to something in front of you the way you should or didn't poach or didn't, uh, you know, didn't make the right move or didn't move sideways instead of forward. So you should know that. And then, so it's a recognition of what's happening in front of you. And then it's an immediate response, you know, usually by having, you know, written things down and having things, you know, me or someone that's a professional player has more experience with this because it's happened so many times, but it's a, it's an instant you know, kind of quick fix in your brain. Okay, what just happened there? So, it's, so a lot of people would say, like, I when I was playing, I was in my own little world. You know, I wouldn't really make enough eye contact with my partner, and and uh, you know, maybe I wasn't communicating well enough because I was actually running things in my brain as to what just happened and, and trying to fix it. Like, why did I just miss that forehand? I, I pulled off too fast. I, I hit it too far in front of me. I took my eye off the ball. All those, all those kind of things. It's the same with the. Uh, you know, with every stroke of why did I miss that serve? I mean, I pulled my head down, my right arm, my tossing arm came down too fast. I didn't go up and I didn't explode up enough of my legs or something. 
Uh, and it's not my risk. It, it could be anything. And so it's just that recognition. Plus, like you said, your your opponents are, are serving to your back end crossing all the time. You know, it's like you got to pick up on that. You got to pick up, you know, that what what they're doing in front of you. Your opponent's got a huge forehand down line, huge forehand pulling you off the court cross court. What am I going to do about that? Right. So you, you should pick up on things in front of you. So it's it's that mentality of, of trying to recognize what's happening in front of you. I mean, especially with what you can control, because you should know yourself and why you just missed that serve, why you just uh, dumped that volley in the bottom of the net or, or missed long or whatever, or, or stopped at the ball and didn't finish a shot, or why did you just get nervous or what happened uh, at that point, you know, that, that made you nervous or what you can do to, to uh, do better the next time, right? So that's always what's going on in your head because the ideal mindset, I, I say this in the, in the and the video is to let things go right away. And, and you you have your game style, you have your game plan. And, and so you're constantly trying to implement that at every point, right? So it's immediately of, of you got to have a short-term, short-term memory sometimes, right? You got to let it go. Mm -hmm. And then what, what's next? You know, next point, I'm going to try it again. You know, let's just keep going. It's, it's those times again. So you, you're letting things linger and then it, it affects you and your, your level drops and you, you lose a match because of that. And then you, you go back to your, Room later, you write that down and you don't let it happen again. So that's the ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I've got uh, a lot more questions that we're not going to get to, but people can go to uh, danielnestertennis.com to enroll in the course. We do have a a coupon code tennis tribe 15 for any listeners of the show to get 15% off. Um, and yeah, the course, I mean, I, I've gone through four of the modules it looks like five and six are on communication and teamwork and mindset which i haven't gotten to yet um but there is tons more information than we just covered here today um and yeah it's really well done um so let's let's dive into the the rapid fire questions unless you have anything else to to mention about the course uh no uh, i mean i guess i probably shouldn't say everything in the in the seven video course today but <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, just, it might be a little different than uh, what people see online because there's a lot of like technical stuff, which is great. I mean, technical stuff is so important too, but uh, one yeah. thing that, that really helped me, and this is like, I thought was like crazy to hear when I was a kid, like tennis is 90% mental. And then what does that mean? And and then you realize that like <laughs> how important the mental side of, of it is because, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a an approach to the to the game with with your attitude and if you're able to do that day in day out or you know figure out you're trying to maximize that then you're going to raise your level dramatically so that's the 90 percent mental that yeah that people might not understand especially newcomers to the sport yeah definitely yeah and if people do enroll i would encourage you to uh write things down with pen and paper as i was going through it i was having to pause and take notes and rewind yeah. and and re-listen to something because um, there's there's so much information and I feel like a lot of times you say something that that comes so natural to you and there's there's several different things in there that that people can take away. Um, so yeah, I would definitely encourage people to take notes and re-listen to it um, multiple times for sure. Uh, so let's dive into a few rapid fire questions. Uh, what was your favorite tournament, or what is your favorite tournament? Great question. I like two. I mean, uh, I, I'll be biased with the tournament in, in Toronto, Montreal, Canadian uh, mm -hmm. National Bank Open. But uh, <laughs> if those aren't included, uh, then uh, definitely Wimbledon is so special. It's such an, a beautiful place to play tennis, uh, the grass I and mean, everything is like first class. And uh, but also Indian Wells. I mean, so many memories there. It's such a beautiful setting to play tennis, such a be beautiful part of the world. And uh, so very fortunate to have, uh, you know, played in some of these uh, amazing places. Mm -hmm. what, what's your favorite uh, position on the doubles court between the four? Uh, I think, I, I mean, serving, I was pretty good. I think I'm pretty good as a, as a service partner. And uh, I mean, I was pretty good at the net. I, I would say that's uh, good hands around the net and, and and good feel and, and i actually became a much better volleyer in doubles once i just started playing doubles i mean first 10 years of my career was was more about uh, singles and and certain volleying mm -hmm. singles it's it's not the same movement and and you know it's the, the the putting balls away and, and the positioning and all that so 
I think I, I really improved in that and I became one of the best, uh, you know, I, I thought, I mean, I say that in the video, I, I just tried not to have weaknesses. So I, I wouldn't say I was the best at anything, but I was, I tried to be solid everywhere. But uh, I think that's just maybe God's gift uh, to me was uh, having uh, good hands. Who was the toughest opponent you played and why? And that, that could be a team or a particular player, like somebody um, maybe you struggled against more than, more than others. Well, I mean, it can't, it's hard not to say the Bryans are the, they're the best team of yeah. all time. But, uh, I yeah. mean, I obviously had some success against them, but uh, I mean, the Woodies back in the day, I mean, probably also because I was playing more singles then and I wasn't just a doubles player in the, in the 90s. So I wasn't as good in doubles. And I don't know, they, I felt like they had me on a string sometimes. And, you know, I felt like these guys could, were hitting the ball. It's like they knew what you were going to do before they hit the ball. It, it was It was unbelievable. So they were they were special. I mean, I mean some of the newer guys. I mean these guys were hitting the ball so big, but uh, I mean Michael Lodra had a had a huge serve, and it was tough to play against because you know lefty and and I thought he was so talented. And and then uh, a new guy like Henry Continent. I mean, I just, <laughs> this guy was so talented. Uh, I just can't believe he didn't play longer. And but yeah, somebody's. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but there's you know yeah. so many good players. Uh, so many talented guys out there. What's your favorite tennis book? Favorite tennis book? I haven't read that many. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just be biased because I'm in Andre Agassi's book. Uh, you know, there, there was okay. a down point in his career when, uh, when uh, yeah, I don't think he mentions my name specifically. Maybe he does, but I can't remember. I read it a long time ago. But uh, down point in his career was uh, he was on the way down. He was still top ten, top five when we played, but. Uh, Shortly after that, he started having some issues off the court, and uh, but uh, he he got kicked off, kicked out of our match for swearing at the umpire. So that was a funny moment for me, not for him. But uh, <laughs> so just being biased, but I enjoyed that book. I mean, he was such a great player and such a great personality. And I guess I haven't read too many tennis books uh, to yeah. to be able to to put a list there to choose from. It's a, it's a good choice, though. I've read I read that one a long time yeah. ago as well, and it's it's a yeah. fantastic book. Um, do you have a favorite non-tennis book? Favorite non-tennis book? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> can you save that for the, the end of the round? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> think about that we can sit on it. Um, so this is actually the last question. <laughs> so yeah. the last question. Uh, maybe you can send it to me after and uh, and I'll mention yeah, it. Yeah, let's uh, do it after. Um, how can we make doubles more popular? uh how can we make doubles more popular well, I mean, television obviously i mean i, I you know if i'll just give an example like sometimes uh you have a, a final of a, of a tournament you're in the finals of, on sunday single final doubles final and you know there's just too much of a gap between the matches i mean it's almost like they just don't want any chance that the doubles final runs into the singles final i just you know i just totally get why you know singles is where it's at and and the popularity aspect but I mean, doubles is, you know, a very well uh, participated sport. And, you know, so having, you know, a, a singles fan or a tennis fan or whoever's watching the singles final that day, tuning in and watching the end of a doubles match, you know, because it went a little bit longer is, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, th I just think, you know, it's a different game. It's different skills and, and it's fun to watch it, especially if it's played well. And, and I mean, usually if it's a final, then it is being played well because everyone's more confident when they're in the final. So, uh, and you know, plus it's just interesting for the, for a fan to, to see who's going to win the tournament and see how players react under pressure. So I just, I would like to see, you know, just give them a little bit more of a chance and, you know, a little bit more, uh, recognition and a little bit more TV time and you know even like just like a daily summary of the best points who won you know some videos of that would, would be good but uh you know this is an ongoing thing yeah and I mean, so the tennis in, in general is doing very well singles especially doubles is fine and, and I think it, it's in a good place so don't mm -hmm. wanna yeah yeah I agree yeah I think uh for the U.S. Open final they had the the women's doubles before Djokovic and Medvedev and it was nice to yeah. see I was watching it on TV and some of the some of the fans who came to watch Djokovic Medvedev came into the doubles match at the end yeah um and there were some really exciting points and you could tell like yeah. a lot of them 
I mean, I bet a lot of them probably didn't even know a doubles match was going on beforehand because I don't think yeah, it says that's it another on the problem. ticket. The marketing, um, yeah. yeah, the marketing's yeah. A, a huge thing. Uh, but it was good for the scheduling that way um, because, yeah, a lot of these fans came in early yeah, not knowing that there was a doubles match going on, I would think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, they got to see some of it. So maybe now a few of them are, are doubles fans and that can kind of build over time. Yeah. So, and a Canadian won that match. Two Canadians. Well, one plays for New Zealand now, but uh, yeah, yeah. We I had Aaron on the show last week. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that was a, a great run for them. Yeah, um, quite great. Awesome. So, uh, for anyone listening, if you want to check out Daniel's course, Daniel Nestor Tennis.com, coupon code Tennis Tribe 15 for 15% 15 off. Daniel, any final words, requests of the audience? No, I mean, uh, just enjoy enjoy playing tennis. Tennis is, I mean, such a, a great sport for for health and, and lifetime, enjoyment, social, everything. And and it's better than pick a ball. No, I just throw <laughs> that in there. <laughs> but it so, is. But uh, no, I, I just think, uh, you know, you know, it's it's such a good thing to be part of, and and you know, it's just it's for so many different aspects. And and thank you for having me on, and uh, and uh, hope uh, you keep doing a great job. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for everything you've done for the sport, and uh, hopefully we can do a round two at some point. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. If you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches, then join the Tennis Tribe Double Strategy newsletter. Every single Thursday, I'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match. And when you join, you're gonna get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will, I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe, and over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players, all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So to sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.